Hi. So that was exciting presence. That was, yeah, very cool. Um, hi, I'm Mark Rendell. Um, thanks for having me over to talk to you about stuff. Um, everyone had a good day so far? Yay. Yes! My God, you do talk. That's <laughs> awesome. I, I quite like when there's some sort of audible feedback from the audience. I used to do stand-up, and so if I talk for more than five minutes without getting a laugh, I feel like it's going really badly. So anything useful, just big laugh, and then we'll all be fine. So yes, this talk is called Hidden Complexity. Um, and I do a couple of uh, frameworks, libraries, whatever you want to call them, uh, called simple.data and simple.web. And uh, the idea behind them is that they make it very, very easy to do stuff quickly and easily and with a minimum of code. And in order to achieve that, I write enormous amounts of code uh, that under the covers do all sorts of bizarre stuff. And I have learned an incredible amount of stuff while I've been writing these frameworks. And some of it's really interesting, so I just thought I'll do a talk and I'll share some of the stuff that I've learned. So um, that's what this is about. Uh, so yes, Wizard of Oz quote. Do you have Wizard of Oz? Is that a big film over here or? Yeah, anyway. Uh, normally, when people sort of go, oh, simple data looks like very complicated code, and you're just kind of like, yeah, but ignore that, because you don't have to worry about that. I worry about that. I have tests covering that. You just worry about that single line of code that you've written that does something cool. But today, we are going to pay attention to the code behind the curtain. So the first tip is a really, really simple one, um, and it's not a difficult thing to do at all. If you're using C Sharp 4 uh, or above, you have the dynamic keyword. And the dynamic keyword basically says to the compiler, I know what this variable is. I know what it does. Go away, and we'll worry about it at runtime. And this is incredibly useful. And simple data kind of builds on that whole dynamic thing by creating an object that has really no methods or properties or anything at all. And then at runtime, you say find by ID, and it goes, I understand find by, and I understand ID, so I'm going to say select star from table where ID equals, and puts all those things together. And so when I'm writing uh, simple data, um, it's all test driven. And I'd try to do test driven development on lots of .NET projects before, and never really found that it clicked for me. And part of the problem is that uh, test-driven development is very popular in, in Ruby and Python and JavaScript. And in those, you can write whatever you like, and the test will run, and it will fail because the method's not there. And in C Sharp, you can't get to the point where the test runs without going off and creating the class and creating the method on the class that takes a number of parameters. And so you've kind of already decided what your API is going to look like before you start writing the test. Otherwise, you just get squiggles all over the place and all this sort of thing. Whereas with simple data, I have this database object, which is dynamic. And I can just go, well, I think I should be able to specify a table name as a property and then do a query by name and then stick dot distinct on the end of that. And that should generate this set of SQL. And because it's dynamic, I can build it and run my tests immediately. And it just goes, yeah, you have you muck that up. You get a C sharp runtime binder exception. Um, but Having kind of learned that from simple data, I took that back and applied it to all my other development as well. And it's great because you can basically have a, an account object. And if I go over to the account object uh, there, if I, God, I hate Macs. Never, never buy a Mac. Um, <laughs> so yes, there we go. Go to declaration. So my account class, I don't have, uh, I've, I've commented out the disable method because we've all seen how well it goes when you try to write code live on stage. So I've given up on that. Um, I'm just going to do this and uncomment code live on stage. Much easier. Um, so I can write my account test. And I actually get, I've got nCrunch running on here, which is a, an auto test runner. Sits in the background, works out when you've changed something, does a shadow build, and runs your tests and everything. And I get my little risk progress bar down at the bottom here that says, you've got a failing test. 
but it's telling me I've got one failing test. It's not telling me that my project doesn't build. Because if your project doesn't build, that doesn't give you any information about where you actually are. It just says your project's not building. You could have 100 failing tests. You could have all your tests would pass if you just remembered to put that semicolon in uh, or, or close that brace. So it's not giving you any information. If you use dynamic and you've got an auto test runner, whether it's nCrunch or continuous tests, you've always got this information about exactly how badly you've mucked up your code base. Remember the letter M there instead of the letter F. That was really good. I tend to get in trouble for swearing at these things, so please excuse me if that happens. And turn your phone off, just as a tip. <laughs> um, so yes, and then I can go over into my account class, and I can, uh, I can uncomment uh, those two lines of code. Uh, and then I can go back to uh, my account test class. And you can see now that NCrunch has carried on running that for me. And I'm getting the nice little red dots that appear on the side there with an X on the line that's failing. So now I have my account class. And it's got a disable method on it. So it's pushing past that point. And then if I just go back into here and just delete that out there and that out there, and then I can switch back to account test. And NCrunch will run that for me. And they go green. And then at that point, at no point have I had a solution that didn't build, because I was just saying dynamic new account. And then the compiler would just ignore the fact that there wasn't a method called disable on there. And so at every point throughout this, I've had my, my solution has built, and my tests have run. They failed, but they failed at a very useful point. Um, and so this actually makes TDD. Uh, a reasonable and worthwhile and usable thing in .NET development. Uh, so that's my first tip. And um, if, if you learn nothing else <laughs> from this, then that's the one that people go, I'm actually going to use that. And they go off and they do. Um, so that's, that's great when you've got a class that you're writing a test for. But if you haven't got the class, then you've still got to go off and create the account class and so forth. So what I've done uh, for that is I have a target factory that I put into um, every project that I make. And my target factory uh, has a single dynamic instance. Um, and then in here, I can just uncomment uh, dynamic target equals uh, target factory dot instance dot customer. Um, and then in here, I can just put uh, public. Uh, customer, and I can build my, uh, my code up from there. So that's a way of getting around the whole, I'm adding a class that doesn't exist, and that's going to uh, give me a failing test as opposed to a build error as well. So down at the corner here, I've still got this thing that's saying one failing test, and I can see what that test is. So there you go. That's the first tip. It gets more complicated now. Hands up who thinks that's a good thing. Hands up who's got hands. Jolly good. So staying with the, uh, the dynamic theme for, for the minute, um, and therefore with simple data, because simple web's not dynamic at all, um, at the same time that we got the dynamic keyword and the compiler trickery around the dynamic keyword, Microsoft also added a whole bunch of uh, dynamic support classes. Uh, and there's like expando object, where you can create a new expando object and assign it to a dynamic and then set any properties you want. And it'll just go, yep, I'll take that property, I'll take that property. It's like the bitch of .NET development. Um, God only knows what it's doing internally. It's incredibly slow, um, but very, very powerful. Uh, there's a, a lesser object called dynamic object. So actually, the way uh, you do this is you implement an interface called iDynamic Object Meta Object Provider or something like that. Uh, and it's incredibly complicated, and you have to worry about call sites and all this sort of stuff. And if that had been it, then that would have been it, and no one would ever have touched it. But Microsoft created this dynamic object abstract class that you can inherit from, and then you can just override methods. Um, and this is something that, again, people working in dynamic languages take completely for granted. So in Ruby, if you have a class, you can define a method missing uh, method on there, 
which takes the name of the method and the args to the method and the block that was passed to the method, and then you can just say, well, if there was a method called that, it would probably have done this. Um, and things like Active Record, the Ruby ORM, use this to create what they call magic methods. Uh, and simple data, let's be honest, just completely rip that idea off and use dynamic object to do it. And dynamic object, uh, where are we? Fun with dynamic object. So we'll set that as the startup project, if we can find that. And we'll just open this up, close everything else. So yes, in here, we have a dynamic expando equals new silly putty. And if I go to the declaration of silly putty, you can see that it inherits from dynamic object. I'm going to close my tests down for now. Um, and it just overrides various bits and pieces on there. Um, and uh, you can say you can override try get member and try set member. Uh, and then just store the stuff internally in a dictionary of string object. Uh, and this basically means that you can create an object that does anything you like. Uh, and you can put extra functionality into that try get member and try set member. And one thing that you can do with this, and I'm not going to patronize you by showing you the code to do it, I'm just going to leave it as an exercise for you later on, is uh, who does MVVM, WPF, or Silverlight development? Yeah. View models. I notify property changed. Yeah. Absolute pain in the ass implementing I notify property changed. If you've got ReSharper on there, it's still an absolute pain in the backside to implement that. With this, you can derive a view model wrapper from dynamic object and override try get member and try set member and just put the I notify property changed implementation in there. And then you can bind to that object from WPF or Silverlight in four or later. Uh, and it just does your property change notifications for you. And if you want to do the kind of Google Angular thing, you can stick some code in there that just polls in background to see whether the underlying object is. And yes, I use my hands, Rob. Um, sorry. He forgets that the lights are on sometimes. So yes. And then there are other cool things that you can do. So we have a custom example here. Uh, so we create a new instance of silly putty. And then we have uh, variable dot say. Uh, let me just run this quickly uh, like that. So you can see that that's um, picking up uh, the what up there and the goodbye there. So um, I've basically said, imagine there's a method called say. And imagine it has named parameters. Uh, and the first main parameter is what up, and the second main parameter is goodbye. Uh, and then we can actually pull those out and get those up into the code there like that. Uh, and if I change uh, that parameter there, then we can um, see that that gets picked up and says, I love you there. And so you can use these fake named parameters as additional information uh, for your code. They're basically magic strings, but they're not in quotes. And uh, they make, that makes it look a bit better. It makes it a bit more obvious to someone reading the code what's going on there. Um, and that's incredibly easy to implement as well. Uh, we just have try invoke member. Um, and we just do a quick check against binder.name. So we have this invoke member binder, which has got all the information from the calling uh, location in the code that says, this is what this was called with. And it tells you uh, in the call info that there was an argument names array. And you can see how many argument names there were in there. And then we could just loop through this and put everything together. Um, if you're working with C Sharp, you can actually go in there and uh, using reflection and bypassing the fact that Microsoft have marked some things as sealed and internal, uh, call them anyway. And you can actually tell whether the call to that method is expecting a return value or not, which is really just awesome. I love that. And simple data uses this. Uh, to work out, if you do an insert operation, whether it needs to select the record back and return it. So if you say db.something.insert, 
then it'll just go, well, you're not using a return value, so I won't do that select. So it can optimize the SQL that it's running against the database. But if you say var new row equals db.something.insert, then it will put on that select star from table where scope identity. Um, so it's a, a really nice optimization that you can do there. So I'm not sure how useful this is to anybody who's not actually writing simple data. Um, but I have used it in a couple of other places. And, and like I say, there is the view model thing, uh, which is quite handy. So that's, that's tip number two. What's next? Operator overloads. Again, so an awful lot of the stuff that is in this talk has come from looking at other languages. It follows on quite nicely from Martin's talk, actually, and working out things you can do that are basically evil like landing a helicopter in the upstairs room halfway through my talk. Um, who's overloaded an operator in, in a .NET class? It's, ah, oh yes, it's awesome fun. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a library for Ruby, um, which actually was written by uh, Y, where uh, it puts paths together, um, and it applies the divide operator to strings. And uh, it then puts in whatever the path delimiter is on the current platform. So if you're running it on Windows, it'll put in a backslash. And if you're running it on anything else, normal, it'll put in a forward slash. Uh, but you can't do that in, in .NET, because you can't override the operator for a pre-existing class, uh, which is kind of fair enough. Um, yeah, I wish you could. But what you, you can do some interesting things. Uh, what can you do in here? Uh, so let's set that as the startup project. And we'll open this code up here. Um, so in here, we have a class called column. Um, and on the, uh, let's just take that one out, and we'll put that in there. Um, so we say console.writeline new column ID equals equals 1. Now, without an operator overload, this would just say, well, that's not going to work because column isn't Boolean uh, and has, uh, has no way of, um, of being evaluated by equals equals. Uh, but if I actually run that code, you can see that it prints up ID equals equals 1. And that's because it's overridden the equals equals operator um, and also the not equals operator, because uh, when you've got these two different uh, operators, you have to override both of them. That's one of the rules of operator overloads in, uh, in C Sharp. So it overrides equals equals and overrides not equals and returns an expression object uh, and just says this is the operator and this is the left operand and this is the right operand. And so you can uh, basically just completely subvert the language and bend it to your evil will. Um, and so that works very nicely. And that just takes a column as the left-hand side. And then you can compare column to anything at all, which means you can basically build link-like queries, but without the Lambda syntax, and just put whatever you want in there. So that was quite cool. That was how I initially put um, random queries uh, with more than equality into simple data. And then someone went, but I've got more than one piece of criteria. And it, well, yes, of course you have. That's quite common. First name equals this, and last name equals this. And so I wanted to get uh, Boolean logic working on top of this as well. You can't override the AND and OR. You can't override the Boolean AND and OR operators in C Sharp. It's, it's not something you can do. Um, you can override the bitwise AND and the bitwise OR. And so there was a version of simple data that I put out there that would allow you to do Boolean logic across your expression, but it was using the bitwise operators. And I wasn't entirely happy with that. And I, went, I, I was complaining on Twitter that C Sharp doesn't let you override these things. And John Skeet, um, <laughs> who for some reason follows me on Twitter, <laughs> went, yes, you can. Uh, all you have to do is override the true and false operators and the bitwise operators. And this is, this is pure evil. So 
I just I love this. This is this is one of my favorite things that I've ever done in any programming language ever. So you override the bitwise operators, the, the bitwise and and the bitwise or to return an and and of the left expression and the right expression. And then you override true to return false, and you override false to also return false. And what that does, because C sharp's or operators and and operators are um, essentially, we're going to just stop at this point uh, if this goes any further. Uh, if you return false for both things, it will just make sure that the entire expression gets evaluated. And so you can just go, yay, so the or thing carries on going because it's got that, and the and thing carries on going because it works out that the other way around is doing something else. And so, yes, you get the whole thing just gets... Um, I didn't even know you could override true and false uh, before John Skeet shared that little nugget with me. And so now I can run that piece of code, and I can get id equals 1 and name does not equal mark. Um, so, yes. There you go. But you can also, um, you know, simple data overrides every single operator that there is. It overrides divide and times and plus and minus and modulus uh, and just wrenches all these things into expressions and then throws them through to whatever your underlying database is. Uh, you can have enormous fun with that. It's, it's the closest you can get to writing a DSL inside C Sharp is to say, OK, the left-hand side of this is a class I have control over. And therefore, whatever symbol comes next, I can decide what that means. So you can override the bitwise shift operator to make it concatenate something onto a funky string builder alternative that you've written. You can do all sorts of mad stuff. And just, uh, yes, probably not in enterprise code. But hey, let's see JavaScript do that. What else can you do? MEF. Does anyone use MEF? OK. So MEF, uh, MEF actually now is an IOC container. It wasn't, but now we're on MEF 2.0 and above, and, and that does work as IOC. Um, I used to have enormous fun telling people to ask the guy who wrote MEF whether it was an IOC container, but he spoiled that fun now. Never mind. So um, I like MEF because I write lots of things that allow plugins. And plugins are great because you can just write something really basic and then other people write all these extra add-ons and stuff for it and people just go, wow, it does so many things. That must be really hard work. And you go, oh, yes, it is. Donate money to my pledgy. They don't, but you can ask. Um, so yes, MEF is, is fantastic fun. And uh, it just makes it really, really easy to load components in at runtime when you can reflect over an assembly. And so uh, in simple data, um, if I just open up the Solution Explorer for a minute and collapse everything there. So I have the simple data project, and that's the core. Uh, that just does all the hideous operator overrides and everything else and generates this intermediate uh, mongle of, of objects. And then that passes that through to an adapter. And uh, the adapter in the base project is the ADO adapter. Um, and that generates the SQL from simple data's abstraction of whatever it was that uh, the developer asked for. And so that's loaded using MEF. And then the ADO adapter again uses MEF to load a provider. And the provider uh, can be SQL Server or SQL Compact or SQL Lite or someone's written an Infamix one. Um, it's on GitHub. So if you are writing some code that runs against an Infamix database, uh, you can come forward in time to, to the current year and get that off GitHub and then take it back to the 1990s. Um, <laughs> hands up who's even heard of Infamix? Yeah, old people. <laughs> so yeah, now 
the thing is, when you're writing plugins, um, and this is something that people quite often, when you're writing an enterprise application or something, if you're selling it to more than one customer in particular, then the ability to add plugins onto it is actually quite useful. Um, and so I've written quite a few things that have gone out and done very, very boring kind of warehouse control systems and so forth, where we have said, uh, we'll do a plugin system. You end up writing all the plugins for them as well, because you know warehouse people tend not to have people who can write C sharp uh, working in the warehouse. Um, but it still means that you've got this core product that is nice and self-contained, and then you just extend it a little bit. And so you create loads of interfaces that the people who want to write plugins for it uh, need to implement. And what I was finding with simple data was I created an interface, um, let's, let's see as an example, or a base class. So there's adapter. Um, and adapter is the base class for any adapters that go in there. Um, and I, the initial adapter, it's just kind of like it's got a, a find and an insert and an update and a delete, and that's pretty much it. Um, and then people start going, oh, can you do transactions? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do the other? And you've got a whole load of people out there, and I mean, I have like a, a dozen people each separately maintaining their own project to make this work with a particular database. There's a guy who's done an OData adapter for it, so you can use the same syntax to talk to um, I was going to say any OData data source, but basically it's the Netflix API. Um, oh no, NuGet as well, so you can use it to query NuGet, there's two. Um, and if I go, someone says, can you make it do this? And I say yes, and then I add a method to an interface or an abstract based class, I've broken 12 other people's code, and that generally makes them unhappy, and it means that after a while, they stop trying to keep up with you. And so as an alternative to that, um, I came up with the uh, I was reading uh, Clean Code and the SOLID principles and the I in SOLID, which stands for the Interface Segregation Principle, which says that each interface that you have should be as small as possible and as self-contained. So you just have like the three methods that do this. And then you want to add functionality to that. You don't add methods to the interface. You add another interface that people can implement if they want to. And you can have more than one interface on a class. And so when I came to add transactions, rather than adding begin transaction and end transaction to the adapter class, which for anyone outside of ADO would probably have been throwing a not implemented exception anyway, and not implemented exceptions and not supported exceptions are evil. Not implemented exception is there for ReSharper to use when it puts in the automatic implementation of a method, and not supported exception is just evil and wrong and babies die. Um, so rather than doing that, if there's a method on an interface that isn't necessarily applicable to everything that's going to implement that interface, create another interface. And then let people implement that interface as well if they want to. Because if you do that, you can say uh, variable other thing equals this object as that interface. And then you can immediately say, is that going to work? You don't have to try calling it and catch a not supported exception. Uh, so that is just a general useful tip that I don't need to show any code for. But um, the MEF side of it is, is quite cool, because what we have uh, in the MEF code, where's my MEF helper? Um, so the MEF helper has this compose thing, which is just a wrapper around some fairly complicated uh, MEF code. And then there's get adjacent component of T. And what that does is it says, OK, I've got the type of my adapter. So this is the ADO adapter. And I'm going to go to the assembly that that adapter came from. And I'm going to see if there's an exported type of this other interface. And if there is, then I can create an instance of that. So you've got the thing where you've already got the object, and then you can try casting it to an optional interface to find out if, uh, 
if it supports this additional functionality like beginning a transaction. But then there's this get adjacent component thing where rather than saying to these developers, OK, you've got to put all this stuff in one massive class, I can just say, you've got your core thing here. This is the thing that you have to implement, and I'm going to look for it. And then there's a bunch of other interfaces that you can optionally implement and export. And if they're there, I'll use them. And if they're not, then I'll revert to some default functionality. And a good example of this is actually in the ADO project, where we've got the ADO adapter inserter. Um, and this has an insert many uh, thing. So you can send an I innumerable of objects to a table, and it will do uh, a bulk insert. And if you just execute an insert command over and over again, even if you've prepared it and you're just changing parameters, run that for 5,000 objects, it's going to be very slow. And so I wanted to say to the people writing the ADO providers, here's a way that you can optimize that if there is some way of optimizing it. And so I added an iBulk inserter interface, um, which is there, um, that does that. And then, for example, in the SQL Server provider does that. Yeah, it just it takes that bunch of stuff there. Um, but in the SQL code, uh, there is a optimizing implementation of this that says, I'm going to use SQL bulk copy, stick this all in the data table, and this will insert 5,000 records in five seconds, as opposed to the five minutes that it takes if you do them one at a time. And so uh, most of the uh, ADO providers don't have an optimization for this, because MySQL, for example, there isn't a MySQL bulk copy, um, because uh, it's quite difficult to do, and Microsoft have done naughty things underneath the covers, and, and it's all very antitrust. Um, <laughs> but Oracle, uh, if you're using the right Oracle provider, um, the right Oracle ADO provider, which is basically the DevArt one, then there is an optimization for this. And the guy who maintains the Oracle provider for simple data has done that, and it conditionally exports things, and it's all very, very clever. Um, but basically, this means that people who can't, who don't have an optimization available, just ignore that and, and never have to worry about it. And, uh, and I can use MEF to work out whether there is uh, an optimization available or not. So that's quite neat. So how are we doing? Has anyone, we've got one more to go, and it's, it's the really fun one. Um, has anyone learned anything that they're actually going to turn up to work on Monday morning and go, ah, I can do this with that? One person. No, there's no, a few people. A few people. Is it just the thing with dynamic at the start? <laughs> and, and the rest of this is quite interesting, but yeah, you're just going to leave me to it. Fair enough. So. Runtime code gen. There are a really limited number of use cases for this, but there are use cases for it. Um, and this is going to be redundant as soon as Roslyn comes out anyway, but God knows when that's going to be. So let's talk about it. So who's, uh, who's done runtime code gen of any description? Who's used reflection.emit to do that? Because, oh my god, that's fun. Um, I had one use case where I actually had to write some reflection.emit code to do something at runtime. There was, just, there was no alternative, and it was hideous. It's basically writing assembly language, except it's writing assembly language wrapped in C sharp. So you've got your opcode dot uh, push, opcode dot push, opcode dot call, opcode dot pop, and yeah, it's it's not nice. Um, and I was in, uh, I was at Codemash at the start of this year, and I watched Bill Wagner's talk. Bill Wagner's the guy who wrote Effective C Sharp and More Effective C Sharp, and he did this talk called uh, Stunt Coding. I dare you to try this at home, and he showed using expressions to do runtime code generation. So expressions were introduced in .NET 3.5. Uh, you need them for link, because uh, when you pass that lambda through to a where clause or a first or default clause or whatever it might be, 
um, the iQueryable implementations have to take it apart so that they can turn it into SQL or whatever else it might be. Um, and in .NET 3.5, Expressions were limited to a single expression. It had to be a start and then whatever it was and then a semicolon. So if you could combine things together with and and or and, uh, and that sort of thing, then it counted as a single expression. And people went, this is really awesome, though. I want to be able to do more with this. And so .NET 4, um, they introduced blocks into the expression system. And so you could basically create a block of code, which was a list of other expressions, and put all these things together and pass parameters in. The upshot is that you can generate entire methods using the expression system, uh, and you can, have <laughs> you can have fun with this. Trust me. We're going to a good place. There may be puppies. Do you have the puppies thing here in Sweden? I don't know. Maybe that's just a British thing. So let's open this up, and we'll, we'll carry on. Uh, I've just gone really dark and, and wrong. Um, so yes, uh, who's used AutoMapper? Auto yes, because you have to use AutoMapper, because it's the only way you can stop sticking DB contexts into serialization streams when you're using Entity Framework because you haven't seen the light yet. Um, but yes, AutoMapper does enormous amounts of code generation because it knows that it's generally in a hot path in your code, and it doesn't want to be using reflection uh, every time you want to copy something from one place to another. So convert here, I've got um, a Dictionary, where am I defining row? So test data, and if we go down to test data uh, down there, we can see that we've got a dictionary of string objects. So simple data uses dictionaries of string objects all over the place. And in there, I've got an ID count and a name Jennifer and a date of birth, which is set to something else. And I'm just returning however many of those back uh, are required at this point. Um, and then up here, we've got use reflection. And we basically say, uh, I've got my type here, t, which is person. And for every, uh, every record that we come past, we're going to go to the type of t. Uh, and we're going to say, give me your properties. And then we're going to look in the dictionary and see whether it's got a key for that property. And if it has, then we'll use property.setValue. That's the point where this really falls down, because property.setValue is hideously slow and unoptimized. And so if I run this code using this reflection thing here for um, however many records that was, a million records, uh, that took three and a half seconds. And that's because we're using dynamic invocation against the property to uh, create the, the, to set the value at runtime. And that's very, very slow. And so you can optimize that. You can do the reflection once, and then essentially use expression.setValue um, to generate some code which sets the property for you. And underneath the covers, this is using reflection.emit. But someone has very nicely wrapped all that up for us in, uh, in this expression system. Um, so if I run this again, and we'll do the, uh, the use converter version as well, and then we'll take a look at what that actually does. So three and a half seconds for uh, that, and then one second. So nearly four seconds for using reflection, and just one second for the code generated version. And if you imagine that this is going into a web server uh, where that's going to be hit by 50,000 people a minute, and it's going to convert 1,000 database records, uh, whether it's from entity framework things via AutoMapper into something that can be serialized to JSON or whatever it might be, actually, that saving starts to look pretty good because that's potentially the difference between having to spin up four load-balanced servers 
to handle your user load and being able to spin up just one server or two smaller servers because load balancing is still a good idea. Um, so if you were using emit to do this, you're right there. If you started trying to do the, uh, the code necessary to ask a dictionary whether it had a key uh, for this particular string, and then if it did, call the indexer on that dictionary with that key to get that value out of it, and then set the property on another object, if you were doing that with opcode.emit, then this idea that a method should fit on a screen would just have gone right out of the window. You'd have like a screen full of method just to call the indexer on that dictionary. It's really quite scary. And it's, it's just a lot easier now where you've got um, the expression system. Because you've got this lovely you know, opcode, it's kind of like push and pop and call and everything else. Whereas when you're using the expression system, you've just got uh, expression.parameter. So no points for guessing what that does. And you've got expression.variable uh, with uh, type of t. And so we're going that, that creates a variable. You can give the variable a name, actually, if you want to. Uh, you can go to the end here, uh, and you can uh, give it a name which is entirely pointless. It doesn't need a name. It's going to be assigned an automatically generated name uh, by the underlying system. And then just this. So who uses activator.createInstance? Yeah? Activator.createInstance is painfully slow. And you can just say target constructor equals type of t.getConstructor, and then uh, use type.empty types. Who's never seen type.empty types before? That's a static, read-only, empty array of types that's on the type. So you know you're like string.empty, which you're supposed to use instead of quote, quote, because it saves the uh, CLR creating instances of that. So type.empty types. Eventargs.empty. There's static empty things on so many types in .NET. I only found that out that that was there when I was working on this code. Not even the code that I've written before that uses this to do funky things. I only found that was there when I was writing this code for this demo. Um, so yes, you just keep learning new things. It's awesome. You don't need to go off and, and learn new languages for exciting things. You can just find exciting things out about the thing you've been using for the last 10 years and thought you knew. Um, and then we've got expression.assign. So uh, that's nice and easy. We've basically got target there, which is our variable. And we've got our target constructor here. And we're just calling expression.new and then passing that constructor in. Those two lines, those, th those three lines there, you can combine together, wrap those up in a block, and create a delegate um, to, to hold that. And you never need to call activator.createInstance again. And that will run in about a tenth of the time that it takes to call activator.createInstance. Because what activator.createInstance is doing is that every single time. And you could just do it once. So that's a nice saving. And then we have an assign here. And then this bit here is essentially the same thing. We're just saying go through and reflect over the properties of this type. Uh, and then we'll get that property off. And we'll, get the, uh, we'll just have a constant to hold the name. Um, this one's a little bit interesting. That's the indexer property off the dictionary there. Um, we'll put an expression.convert in. That's going to do a cast for us. Uh, and that will just throw an invalid cast exception, because I haven't put any handling in there. Um, and we've got contains key. So we can say uh, param up the top there is our dictionary. And we can just call contains key on that dictionary and pass that name to it. So it's all it's readable stuff. I mean, you know, it's not the cleanest, easiest code that you're ever going to write in your life. And you're not going to go to the junior developer and go, can you just tweak that for me? Because they're going to go, no. Um, but it is something that you can come back to in a month's time or six months' time and probably find your way through it again. 
and reflection.emit is not going to achieve the same thing for you. And so um, we've got all this code up here, and we just basically build all these assign expressions. So every single one of these assign expressions is just saying, if the dictionary contains this key, then set the property on the target object to this value from the dictionary and the pass-through convert. And we stick all that into a list of uh, lines of code, effectively. And then we just create an expression block uh, with all those lines of code. And then we create another expression block around that, where we've got the create target and the assign block. And then we wrap all that up in an expression.lambda, uh, which wraps around a func that takes a dictionary and returns t. And once you've written that, it is basically just a matter of uh, use converter. So yes, we just say var convert equals converters dot get for person, and that returns us back a compiled, jitted, now represented by native code method, and then we can just call that method over and over and over again, and we can cache it somewhere in a static variable because as long as you have a bounded, uh, a, a limited set of things, then it's fine to store them in in static variables, and there's a limited set of types in your application, so you can pretty much just cache that, um, as long as you're not randomly generating types as well, in which case you've got bigger problems. Um, and then we could just call that jitted method through every time, and that's why this is so much faster. And actually, if you... Uh, I'm not going to try and do it now because I'll get confused and lost, but if you take off the time that it takes to generate that function in the first place, um, the time that this takes to run goes down by about another 50%. So you've got that one time overhead of generating the code, and then every pass through after that is just taking no time at all. And uh, every time through using reflection and property.setValue or method.invoke or whatever it might be is going to remain linear. So that, yeah, that's never going to get optimized as your application carries on running. So my initial use for this was uh, simple data. Simple data adapters return dictionaries of string object, and then simple data will magically turn those into customers and orders and animals and meals and whatever else uh, is, is in your application. And that was using reflection, and that was quite slow, particularly when people are, are doing a big report thing out of it and printing a million records out to the screen and you've got this reflection going. And so that was a big optimization, and there was a blog post, and I went, yay, I'm clever. Um, and then I came to write Simple Web. Um, I wrote Simple Web because Microsoft broke WCF Web API. Um, WCF, who, who used WCF Web API when it was WCF Web API? That was brilliant. That was, that was like the best framework that Microsoft ever nearly released. <laughs> you just went, here's a URL, here's a way of, of satisfying that URL. And it was, you know, it was powerful, it did content type negotiation, it had media type formatters and all this sort of stuff. And it even did this thing where if you returned an iQueryable of something, then it would say, oh, data. And that was quite good too. And then it all went quiet. They were on 0.6 of Web API, and then it all went quiet for a while. And then they went, we've turned it into ASP.NET Web API. And I got this sick feeling in my stomach and just went, oh, God. And so I uninstalled the WCF Web API package from the project that I'd been using it in. And I installed the ASP.NET Web API package into that same project, and it just wouldn't build. And so I started trying to make the migration from one way of doing things to the other way of doing things. And I realized that what they'd done when they removed the WCF and put on the ASP.NET was break it. So it's for creating RESTful web services. And as we all know, a RESTful web service is essentially CRUD over HTTP, and every single RESTful controller that you write is going to have a get and a put and a post and a delete, and that's all she wrote. 
That's what RESTful means, according to the ASP.NET team. I like Nancy. Um, I like the Nancy framework. It's awesome. Uh, the super duper happy path is Nancy and uh, simple data. And you put those two together, and you can essentially write really quite powerful applications in hardly any code at all. And it's great. And it's very dynamic. And it's for people who have to run on .NET but uh, would rather be writing dynamic code. It's fantastic. But for the use case that I was working on with this project, which is this startup thing that I'm doing, I needed content type negotiation, and I needed it to support async. And Nancy didn't do those things at the time. And so I thought, I'm just going to throw together a, a web framework uh, very, very quickly that does support these things. And so I did, and I called it simple.web. And it's on GitHub, and it's on NuGet. And you can use it if you want to, but you'll probably only want to if your use case lines up almost exactly with mine, because this is something I've written for me. And people come, can you make it do this? And I'm going, eh, no. Um, so for example, I tend to write single page applications these days, which download static HTML, and then everything else is done over AJAX, JavaScript, JSON, all that sort of goodness. And so while it does support Razor, it's crap at it. Um, so if anyone wants to make the Razor support work better, do feel free to fork it and, and contribute hours and hours of your time for very little except me taking the credit. <laughs> That's not funny. And so uh, when you write a web framework, you do a lot of reflection because you've got URIs that come in. You essentially got text coming in over a stream. And you've got something that breaks down that text and turns it into a header collection and a URI and a body. And then you sort of you map over these things, and you're doing this reflection uh, code to go off and find the method that matches to that URI and everything else. And because I was on the high from having done this major optimization in simple data, I thought, I'm going to go and I'm going to use that same expression code generation thing to build the entire pipeline for every web request that comes in, because I can. And so having done it with reflection, I then refactored the hell out of everything to essentially encapsulate that reflection into expressions and run them every time a request came in. And it was painful and possibly not the most sensible thing I've ever done. But as I was going along, and this was entirely accidental, I realized that I was trying to do expression.property and expression.variable and expression.constant and all this sort of stuff for bits of code that were essentially the same. The only thing that was changing was the value that I was putting into the param. And it's just kind of like, so that's, yeah, that's just a method. That's not something I need to be generating every single time I come through. And so I went through and I found all the places where this was happening. And for every single one of those methods, I created a static class. And in that static class, I put an impler method. And then all I used the expressions for was chaining a whole load of calls to these implementation methods together. So essentially, it became like Lego bricks. And so that some of these implementation methods, um, I mean, if you do look at check authentication, um, I had all this code here and all this code here. And I was just blindly putting that into expressions and, and trying to generate that at runtime. And Seriously, that was, that was ridiculous. That was unmaintainable code. Uh, and I just went, well, OK, here are, the, here are the points where things change. Everything else I can encapsulate into a method, which I can step debug through and, and all that kind of good stuff. And I'll just use a very simple series of expressions to say, if my handler implements this interface, then call this method. And if it implements this interface, then call this method. And every single one of these methods basically takes the interface that the handler implements and the context, which is similar to HTTP context. It's got the request and the response, various other bits and pieces. And then this implementation code can do whatever it wants with that context. 
and just set variables in the handler. And so the require authentication interface just says there's going to be a current user property on the handler class. And this code here just sets that current user property if it's there. And if it's not, it calls redirect. And that opened up the possibility. So unlike the actual Lego corporation, um, I'm fine with people making their own bricks. So people say, I need such and such out of the context. I need to get some files out, or I need to, I, I need to check for this header. I want to get the x-something-something -something header. And I go, it's easy. All you do is you, uh, you create your own interface. Let's go to the declaration of that. You create your own interface, which can have whatever you want on it. Absolutely not fussed about that at all. Um, and then you just say, this is uh, something that needs handling during either the request phase or the response phase or the uh, write phase, where it's writing the response back. Um, and here's the implementation for it. And then you go off into there, and you create an impla method that takes this parameter and this parameter. And you can put whatever you want in there. And this has created a nice um, testing story for uh, for simple web. Um, where's a good example? I don't have any good examples. Um, it's not here. But uh, so yes, what you don't do. Um, I this is uh, a rebuild, and I don't have the um, the other code on here. Uh, Generally, in an ASP.NET MVC application, uh, you will go to the context, and you will say, I need a cookie value out of there, or I need something like that out of there. And that means that when you want to write your automated tests for that controller, you have to mock up a context, and you have to mock up the entire context, because it only makes sense. And then that gets handled by the controller and everything else. When you're writing a simple web application, if you have uh, a cookie, you can just put a property on the class for that cookie. And then when you're writing your test, you just say, create a new instance of this class, set that cookie property to something, and then call the get method and make sure that what I'm getting back makes sense. And so you can write a full set of tests without ever having to mock a context or create a, uh, a request object or any of that sort of stuff at all. And anything that you want to get out of that context and use in a particular request, you just write this little implementation thing for it, write a single standalone test for that, and then all your tests on your actual application code are entirely free of the what should be an implementation detail that this thing happens to be running over the top of HTTP. So yes, there you go. That's kind of Lego um, analogies and metaphors and code generation and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, that's me basically out of time. I'm sure everyone's very relieved. Um, I will be around for the rest of the day if anyone wants to come and tell me why all this is wrong. Uh, but apart from that, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, thanks for having me.